2020, Netflix led the charge with a new form of animated adaption. With the vision of Adi Shankar, Castlevania made its premiere on the streaming platform. The animated take on Konami's classic video game franchise, which adapted the events of Castlevania 3. It starred the protagonist, a vampire hunter, pursuing Dracula with the aid of Sylpha Bellinatis and Alucard, Dracula's son, all in an attempt to stop Dracula from exacting revenge upon humanity. Now, in 2023, a new generation of the Belmont clan returns in Castlevania Nocturne. This time, the new vampire hunter that is out to hunt the evil of the night is none other than Richter Belmont, a man who is quite familiar with gamers as the protagonist of Castlevania Rondo of Blood and its very successful, game-changing PlayStation sequel, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Ironically, the port on the Sega Saturn is subtitled Nocturne in the Moonlight. This isn't the only thing different concerning Castlevania. This also applies to this new entry to Netflix. So, how does this new entry stack up to the source material and its previous entry? Well, let's get this out of the way. Whereas Castlevania was an anime take on Castlevania 3 that had taken a few liberties by making some changes and additions to flesh out a story that was already very light in its telling, Castlevania Nocturne takes that concept and goes even further. If you are coming into Castlevania Nocturne expecting a note-for-note -note adaption of the game, you are going to be sorely disappointed. It's anything but that. For instance, the series opens up with Richter as a young boy with his mother, who happens to be the next in the line of vampire hunters to wield the vampire killer in 18th century Boston, no less. This is where the first change comes in, as she is an entirely new character created just for the series. She serves the sole purpose of pushing Richter to become the vampire hunter that he is destined to in a very life-altering way, courtesy of Aurochs. See, in Symphony of the Night, he has ties to Dracula, but he is just a minor character, particularly a henchman to Dracula. But here, he is presented as a major threat, a man with a twisted view on life itself, who only kills out of revenge. Well, at least in the case of Richter's mother. His brazen arrogance and demeanor upon killing his mother reminds Richter that one day he will have to face him in battle. In other words, this establishes a future conflict between the two, a catalyst for Richter's drive to wage war against the evil of the night. Mind you, Richter probably would have taken up the whip later in life, but the introduction of Allrocks as his main focus in life gives him a greater purpose than Richter had previously, despite the outcome of the setup being somewhat predictable. That event in his early days drives him to be a protector and motivates him never to be at his worst. This was something never presented in Rondo of Blood. It's truly welcome here. A job well done by showrunner Clive Bradley. The changes don't stop there. We are taken to 18th century France, a place that is governed by the wealthy and powerful. And these nobles just happen to be vampires that lord over the poor and feed on them. Some are willing to oppose them, which reintroduces us to an adult Richter and newly introduces us to Maria Renard. She also plays a slightly different role in the series. Besides making her a young teen, she is also very active in the story. In Rondo of Blood, she is more of a captive as the player has to save her to unlock her as a character to use in the game. In the series, she is more of a younger sister who chastises Richter from time to time. Her mother is a new character just made for the series as well, as she fits into the story quite well. She ties into the priest's past and what she reveals to Maria outweighs heavily on the character. In other words, there's a reason for her in the story. The biggest change of character in this entire series comes from Annette. In the game, she's Richter's fiance. She is the reason that Richter sets out on his quest to fight Dracula in the first place. In this series, she's a former slave from the island of Saint Domingue, which is modern day Haiti, by the way. I have to be honest, I am not a fan of race swaps. 
See, I truly believe that it's a lazy way to create the character as most of the time it never adds to the character and some or all of the original version of the character is sacrificed just for the sake of shoehorning in diversity. Unfortunately, this is partially the case. It can be said that it's a race swap, but from how she's presented here, she's a completely different character and only the same in name. Whether you like that or not is entirely up to you. But what can be said though is that she's presented as a young woman who is headstrong and assertive. I will speak more about her character later. As for her backstory in episode 3, it shows why she is there in France in the first place. We also get to see how slavery was under the rule of vampires. This is not too accurate considering it was Dessalines who freed the slaves, but it does show a glimpse of the beginning of Haiti's rise to independence from the French capturers. With me being a Haitian American, it was quite refreshing to see that. Speaking of Dracula, this is another change. This time, the main baddie is Elizabeth Bathory, who is actually a real person. See, she was a countess who murdered young virgins with her accomplices to bathe in their blood to stay young. But in this series though, she is a powerful vampire that is out to rule over humanity as a god. To introduce a real life historical figure into something fictional is always a risky slope to conquer especially when it's replacing an antagonist who has always been a major threat to the Belmont clan. Taking into account how the first Castlevania series ended, it makes sense from that standpoint, but it's still an omission that will be decisive among the fan base. We also see a character that is quite pivotal to the games itself, even though it's brief. This person is a catalyst for helping Richter discover his hidden powers. Once again, and not to sound like a broken record, anyone who knows the game and Castlevania lore knows what those powers are. In the series, they are presented as something deadly and phenomenal. Speaking of that, let's get into the strengths and flaws of the characters themselves. Now, there are things that the series gets right, and that's the dynamic between Annette, Maria, and Rick. Just watching the scenes with them fighting side by side was an enjoyable watch. The action scenes were something that the first series nailed and Castlevania Nocturne continues to do that very well. The latter, particularly in episode four, Richter finally encounters the man who killed his mother. Here is where the flaws come in. See, in the game, he is always presented as brash and heroic. A man who proudly takes up the mantle of the Belmont clan. But in episode 4, he does something that can be seen as very off-putting. I understand the writers tried to show some kind of vulnerability with the character, but it was severely misplaced. On top of that, it was a terrible writing choice considering up to this point, he was fierce and strong. Then all of a sudden, he is the total opposite of that. It's not only very inexcusable, but also very insulting to those who invested in the character and the history of the franchise over the years. Also, it was a very unrealistic reaction to the situation that he was facing. At least in episode five, we see his grandfather and him get the iconic headband, which is a great way of showing us how he got it in the first place, but it doesn't escape the fact that the events that led him there were at the expense of making Richter look inferior to make his teammates look stronger in comparison. This shows the lack of the writer's knowledge of the war itself. As for Annette, she seems to have more agency in the story than Richter. Despite her being headstrong and assertive, as I said, she is also a character I found hard to sympathize with. Every scene, it's always about her plight and never the bigger picture. That was very off-putting. She's presented as a take charge woman, but it's so phoned in that it feels very cliche. Despite her having a valid reason for scoffing at Richter after the events of episode four, Annette is a character that elicits no response when it comes to her play. Let's just say that the writers episodes five and six laid on too thick 
when it comes to her plight to a point where it was very cringy and out of place. It certainly doesn't help that they tease a romantic link between her and Richter. I have to be honest, this isn't warranted from the both of them as you don't truly see any kind of chemistry between them. It just feels forced into the story. The series does introduce viewers to characters that play a vital role in the story, especially the Abbot. I would go as far as to say that he's the most well-written character in the entire story. He is a man who has gone against his beliefs because he believes that it's the only way to save mankind. He's presented as a man that you loathe and pity at the same time. A man consorting with evil by selling himself to it so that he can uphold the laws of the church. The man is a living walking contradiction and that always makes a great character in my book. Speaking of well-written characters, Erzabeth and Drolta aren't in that league. I never got a sense of who Erzabeth truly was outside of her claiming that she's God and Drolta also claiming that she was some messiah sent to purge the world. To top it off, Erzabeth is just shown briefly in the entire season, more towards the end of it. Her presence in episode 8 sums up the character entirely. She felt just like any other vampire and never really felt like a true threat. I wish the writers had made a better attempt at showing why she was a threat to mankind. Her character was just there and nothing more than that. At least Aurochs is presented as a fleshed out character throughout the season. We get a glimpse of his character. He's a man who has ulterior motives, an air of mystery about him. The viewer learns in episode 6 why Aurochs murdered Richter's mother in a very candid scene. His reason for doing it is consistent with the character. It was valid, but very twisted. You don't necessarily sympathize with him, but you do get a clear view into his personality. Outside of the Abbot, I have to say that he was the most well-rounded character presented in the entire story. Better than Erzabeth. Maybe he should have been the main villain. Castlevania Nocturne is a decent attempt at recreating a type of story that's hard to translate outside of its medium. It does an admirable job at presenting the characters in a way that elicits some kind of response from the viewer. The main attraction of the series is its presentation. The animation has that outsourced Korean animation look to it. Once you see it enough times, you can instantly recognize it as such. But Castlevania Nocturne still manages to go above expectations. The color palette of the characters were very vibrant, but at the same time had this pastel look to them. This art design fits the setting like a glove. I did have a little gripe with how the characters moved during action scenes, as they weren't very fluid. But that's a common thing with Korean outsourced animation. Also, the dialogue scenes felt like they had verbiage that sounded modern at times, and the excessive cursing from Richter sounded a bit cringy at times, but never to a point where it ruined the character. The same can't be said about his reaction to events that transpired around him. Richter cried three times for goodness sake. This is not how gamers want to remember him or see him as. But when he wasn't just pouring tears, he truly grew into the character gamers knew him to be. Well, more or less. Despite its flaws, Castlevania Nocturne is the type of anime series that's needed in this landscape of digital content streaming. Our taste in content has evolved as more adults are watching animation, especially since the surge in popularity of Japanese animation has gotten during the last few years. And this series lives up to that criteria viewers want to see in adult animation. It's dark, brooding, and unapologetic in its approach. 
What you see is what you get with this series. There is much more story for this series to touch upon. With this being the first season officially upon Netflix greenlighting a second season, we will see if this retelling of a gaming classic ultimately ends up living up to its prestige. Only time will tell. Carry on, Wayward Belmont, and prove that man isn't a miserable pile of secrets. An offering. There. For a burnt offering. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he took a fire in his hand, and a knife. And Isaac said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? Oh, <laughs> oh,